uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us once again this month. Sometimes I just wish we could have a two-way camera here so I could see all of you and, and uh, particularly everybody else could see uh, the, the crowd that uh, we're accumulating here each month to talk and so I could see the fa your faces and, and the interaction, the body language, and uh, we could have more of a town hall forum. Uh, but uh, the Q&A at the end will give you an opportunity to ask questions and uh, look forward to answering those questions. So we'll move into uh, this report. First of all, the disclaimer, and uh, as we look at today's USDA crop report, no real surprises, but there were some significant numbers that do have implications for the price of the market going forward and, and what happens with prices. And, and I thought today's market reaction to the report was quite interesting and told us a great deal as well. But first, before we go into the supply and demand numbers per se, Let's keep in mind that price is a function of supply and demand as modified by the flow of money, something we continue to go back on, and uh, we can show from the data that uh, the value of the dollar impacts money flow either in or out of the commodity sector, and that has a big impact on grain and oilseed prices as well. First, as we look at the dollar, uh, starting off with this chart, which is a weekly continuation chart uh, of the dollar's movement. And we see that for really the last 15 to 17 months or so, we've been trading sideways in a broad sideways trading pattern with more of a bias to the downside. Now, if you look at the far right-hand side of that chart here in recent weeks, we've been holding an uptrend. In fact, the last time we tested it this last week, uh, uh, as Federal Reserve members started talking with a little bit more emphasis on raising interest rates sooner rather than later, we saw the dollar test that chart support line off of the summer lows a couple of times in just one day's time and held both times. And then the short covering pulled it back higher and uh, we saw it rally, but it has not been enough to really turn the charts higher. That may very well hinge on next week's Federal Reserve meeting. The Federal Reserve Open Market Committee will meet on Tuesday and Wednesday, releasing their monetary policy, a revised monetary policy at that, uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Wednesday. And we anticipate that to have a big impact right now, as even though the Fed members, and we had another one out early this, well, we had several of them talking today, uh, but what really made the news was on Friday, uh, when one of the Fed members who's been known as a dove made a comment that we really can't afford to wait too much longer uh, to pick up on monetary tightening once again and raising rates, or we fear, he fears anyway, creation of a bubble on our economy. And we're, if we're going to keep our economy strong, we need to keep moving forward with gradual tightening. Well, that caused the dollar then to rally sharply on Friday. We started seeing some follow through today until one of them, and this is the last of the Fed members to speak today, spoke and said that basically, well, we need to be pretty cautious because the downside risks to this economy may be greater than the upside surprises, so we need to be cautious. So that is now the last of the Fed members allowed to speak before next week's meeting, and that's the context in which we go into the meeting with the markets not expecting a September rate hike. Now, as we look at the impact of that dollar on the CRB index, which is one of the baskets of commodity of commodities that we watch, we see an inverse relationship. Once again, a correlation, statistical correlation of one to one means that if A goes up a certain amount, then B goes up by that same amount, or an inverse correlation would be of one would be if A goes up a certain amount, B goes down by that same amount. So we figure that a, a correlation of 0.7 or minus 0.7 is considered to be a strong correlation. The correlation between the dollar and the CRB index is a minus 0.88 going back to 2009. So that's a pretty strong relationship. Well, then the correlation between that and shown here in the blue shading, um, the value of, of fund ownership of corn, soybeans, Chicago and Kansas City wheat is 0.72. You see that in the upper right hand corner of the chart. So that correlation is strong as well. Strong correlation. The orange line here is the spot futures uh, price for corn. 
I'm sorry, on this chart, I do have one of those charts that shows that, but this chart, it's a CRB index, which we just looked at in the previous chart. And you can kind of see the correlation there. Uh, once again, the orange line being the CRB index going back to January of 2008, and the blue shaded area being fund ownership, net fund ownership of corn, soybean, Chicago, and Kansas City wheat. So the dollar makes a big difference. We went into today's crop report in that context, once again, that maybe we won't raise interest rates. That's the expectation. The dollar pulling back, but some anxious nervousness ahead of next week's meeting. Now, looking how that's played out overall with the uh, commodities, the commodities not all going in the same direction quite like they did last year. This is a year-to-date performance of the commodities. We see here that the soybean complex has done pretty well particularly soybeans, whole soybeans, and soy meal, while corn and wheat have not done so well. So we see the funds, in addition to trading those major commodity indices, are also putting money or taking money out or shorting, either buying long for the ownership of, of a particular assets or shorting particular assets based on what they think they'll do relative to the rest of the basket. And so there's been some diversion there and in, in some uh, diversity in uh, behavior and prices among the various uh, uh, commodities overall. Now looking at today's numbers, we see that USDA came in with a yield of 174.4 bushels for corn <clears throat> and that was near the high end of trade expectations. It was a, a little over a bushel below our uh, trade estimate at 175.6 and once again I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who are out there who filled out our survey and provide us good information. Uh, we're real pleased with how close we came to the estimate. And uh, it's because of you, those of you who are our customers, our clients who are filling out the survey and putting the time into it, that we're able to come up with these estimates that are very respectable in the industry right now, uh, particularly after how close we came in August off just a tenth of a bushel. The crop was smaller than our estimate this time by a bushel, but 1.2 bushel, and smaller than USD's August estimate. So even though it was bigger than the average trade estimate, the trade is now making the assumption that the highest of the yield estimates are behind us, the most bearish of the supply side information behind us. And so from the corn standpoint, while they'll be monitoring harvest results for indications of a change, they're going to assume that this big crop is probably getting smaller and they'll start focusing on the demand side of the balance sheet. Now looking back at history, I see that particularly since 1994 when USDA changed its sampling procedures, there are years when we followed this pattern but then the crop did get bigger again. So it's not a guarantee. My bias is that this crop probably is getting a little bit smaller but the bottom line is it's still a big crop. It's still a record crop. And unless this crop gets substantially below current expectations, we're still looking at ending stocks over 2 billion bushels. Right now, USDA has a crop at 15.093 billion. 15.1 billion bushel crop is a very big crop. Demand is not at that level. We're going to grow stocks unless something dramatically changes. Soybeans, 50.6 bushels per acre. The trade was looking for 49.2 which would be up three-tenths of a bushel. So the trade was braced for an increase in the yield, but just didn't expect this big of a yield. They thought, okay, big crops get bigger, but we're pretty close to what the final will be. But now after a 1.7 bushel increase in the yield, the trade is saying, how big might this crop be in October? How big might it be? How burdensome might supplies get? Now, as I look back, and I think we need to keep in mind, Soybean yields are very difficult to estimate while they're in the field. And the only truth factor here is what happens with the combine. And so this crop, as I look back at history, similar patterns, bigger crop in August, bigger crop in September, there is no real trend here. This crop could get bigger. It could be as big as 52 bushels per acre. And I'll show you the implications a little bit later in this presentation, or it could be smaller. This crop could actually get smaller. And the trade's got to be concerned about that possibility when you consider robust demand. And I'll talk some more about that as we go forward. 
But anyway, right now the trade is uh, USDA is telling the trade a 4.2 billion bushel soybean crop. We had the highest soybean yield estimate based on our survey and at 50.1 bushel and it was a half bushel bigger than our yield estimate. And so pretty significant bearish surprise here. But yet at the end of the day, soybean prices 10 to 12 cents lower, not that significant of a drop in price because of the strength in demand. Now, as we take a look, first of all, at the corn yield, we see the that most states saw a decline in yield. I thought it was significant that Illinois stayed at 200 bushels. We've heard a lot of anecdotal reports from Illinois. Remember, 200 bushel was the record yield set in 2014. A lot of reports, anecdotal reports from Illinois saying this crop just isn't finishing as well as it did in 2014. But USDA is insistent that the crop is there. And the satellite data I've looked at, vegetative health index data, would argue that it is there as well. Anecdotal reports say it isn't. So it's going to be real interesting now to see what the combines tell us in the end where this crop ends up. As I said, my bias is that we're probably getting a little bit smaller overall. Note that Michigan, Wisconsin, Kansas, uh, Virginia, North Carolina all got bigger. The other product, major production states got a little bit smaller. And that's why we had a net drop in the size of the crop overall um, by what, 1.7 bushels per acre. As we look then at uh, the factors going into that, we saw last month that big corn ear weight that was implied, we're still talking about an implied ear weight, but it got lighter, but plant population or ear population got higher. That's actually a calcul that's a measured ear population so you say, how could that happen? They returned to the same plots. Well, it did, and that's not unusual. USDA found more ears per acre this time around than what they did in August. That pulled the implied weight down with the high yield that we have at 174.4. Again, we'll monitor that in the October report. But at this point, we don't expect too significant of a change uh, in ear weights as we, based on history as we go into October. One possibility is a change in acreage. Now, USDA FSA will be updating its acreage numbers at 3 p.m. Chicago time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. At least that's the schedule at this point after we finish up here at the webinar. And that should give us some indications of perhaps whether we have some changes in acreage coming up with the October report. As we look at the soybean yield overall, increase in yield across virtually all the Midwest states. Nebraska, no change. Wisconsin, no change. It was already a very high level. Um, look at the big increase in Illinois yields. Um, very impressive crop in Illinois for soybeans. We're hearing some more problems of sudden death syndrome. We're hearing some problems where it's just been too wet of late. But as of the first of the month when USDA walked the fields, it simply wasn't the case. They saw an improving crop. We did see some losses in the east and in the state of Texas, no change really across the delta and most of the south. Um, so the Midwest states, the big producing states, continuing to get bigger, big crop gets bigger. But now let's see what the combines say. Overall, when we look at the data that went into this, uh, the pod count is kind of in the middle of the pack of what we've seen in recent years. But look at the pod weights. The rains that we've had, the good weather, the favorable weather is giving us very big implied pod weights. Here again, it's difficult to estimate soybean yields in the field, but this would suggest because of the favorable weather we've had for finishing off the crop, that this is how we get our high yields. Looking at ending stocks, USDA didn't make a really a change in their wheat ending stocks. That's largely because they're waiting to see what happens with um, the uh, final production number to come out on September 30th in the small grain summary report. When we look at demand, no real significant changes, although USDA did make some adjustments between classes of wheat, basically boosting hard red winter wheat exports and then lowering exports for some of the other classes, um, but not much in the way of, of changes for the overall uh, 
uh, total for wheat. And when we look at corn, dropped ending stocks to 2.384 with that reduction in yield. That's down from 2.049, so what's at 16.25 million bushels. And that was basically a reduction in feed usage. I think this is the beginning of what we'll see as a regular trend in reducing feed usage for corn. I think USDA has been overly optimistic on that. And I think the other question is whether we can actually reach USDA's target for exports on, cool, exports on corn as well. That possibility does exist that we can, and I think it'd be premature for USDA to reduce it at this point. But I think we're really going to have to see some things come through for it to happen. Right now, the export pace is very strong. I think we'll have an aggressive export program this fall, but soybeans will get the priority, and I think we'll be at capacity, and that could limit corn exports as we get into the heart of the fall this year. On soybeans, now USDA, this is just new crop ending stocks. We need to note that USDA lowered their soybean, their old crop soybean ending stocks estimate to 195 million bushels. 195 million bushels. Now, we anticipated that once we saw this past week's export numbers and saw the census data numbers, well, I was at 203 million bushels. I think I had a little bit smaller crush estimate than USDA uh, giving us the numbers. But overall, we expected to be near 200 million bushels. That's the beginning balance then for the 2016-17 marketing year. You know what USDA was at a year ago? A year ago, as they were forecasting new crop soybean ending stocks for the 2015-16 marketing year, 450 million bushels. We finished with 195. This pattern of overestimating soybean ending stocks is one that's been a strong pattern in 65 to 70% of the year over the past couple of decades. And I'll have more on that here in a little bit. Um, but overall, New crop ending stocks, even with the big crop at 365 million bushels. What happens if USDA is again underestimating exports as they typically do and the crop actually does get smaller? We could, actually, we could suddenly be looking at some very tight stocks. Stay tuned. Now, what if we have a favorable weather season? We never do move in La Nina and South America has better weather than forecast, just as the Midwest had better weather. I'll show you some of those scenarios as we get deeper into it. Um, but right now, I have to be somewhat, well, let me put it this way. Funds who want to be short soybeans have got to be nervous. Doesn't necessarily mean that they should go long soybeans, but it certainly should make them be nervous to be short soybeans. Looking at some of those yield changes we see here, top chart is corn, bottom chart is soybean, showing yield changes going from the September report forward to the final in January, and you can see some of the trends there. Demand is a key globally. China has been the driver of that. The blue bar showing, showing Chinese demand, the green bar showing Chinese imports. Obviously, they move together, uh, the difference being their domestic production. USDA actually pulled their China soybean demand estimates down by 1 million metric tons, or 36.7 million bushels. I don't think it's justified. Overall, when you look at uh, at China and their soybean demand, yes, it's going to be difficult to expand their pork production as much as producers there would like to with their profitable margins because of regulatory limits on expansion of production. But I still think that the data supports this continued expansion following the curve of expanding demand for soybeans. USDA's had a, a strong tendency to underestimate soybean demand in the China, and I believe that trend continues going forward as well. Looking at a history going back to 19, uh, oh, the mid-90s, final soybean stocks tend to come in below USDA September estimate. In fact, it's done so every year going back to 1995-96, except for the, what, six or seven years that are highlighted there where the bars are above the zero axis. Most notably in 2005, 2006, otherwise, if they've been off, it's been very small, 
but they've had some significant years like this last year when stocks ended up significantly lower than the September estimate. Typically, that is largely due to USDA underestimating exports. Now, let me go back. Uh, the first chart, okay, um, this, should, this should say exports. US, USDA has a strong tendency um, to overestimate exports. I'm sorry, I apologize, I get the title wrong there. Should say final soybean exports tend to fall, tend to come in above. And ending stocks below USDA's target. So I'll get that title corrected for next time. My apologies for that. Overall, we tend to see larger exports than USDA forecasts and smaller ending stocks. And so that's the tendency going forward. Looking at global stocks, you see here the numbers 249.07 per wheat, million metric tons. But, and this should, is mislabeled, it should be million metric tons. My apologies again. Try to put the, this together quickly after report, and uh, we'll get that straightened out. Corn at 219.46 million metric tons, soybeans at 72.17. You see where that falls relative to the trade expectations. Trade pretty well nailed it on the corn, uh, a little bit bigger than trade expected on soybeans. And look at it compared to my estimates here for INTLFC stone. On the wheat, I've been consistent with this world wheat stocks estimate, and USDA is coming down toward me and toward my estimates there. On corn, the primary difference is there is our yield estimate based on our survey is higher than USDA for the United States, and uh, our estimation of demand is smaller than what USDA has. Those two things account for the difference between US, us and USDA on ending stocks. On soybeans, the difference is a little bit larger. And what it comes down to is USDA pulled a million metric tons out of Chinese demand that I don't think is justified from the data. And history would certainly be on our side on that. Our production estimate was lower than USDA's. Um, by a half million metric ton or 18 million bushels. Uh, USDA did come down to match our Brazil soybean production estimate for 2016-17, but they remain 3 million bushels, uh, excuse me, 3 million metric tons above us for our Argentina, which is making a shift from soybeans toward corn and wheat. When you account for all that, then we're talking about less than 100 million bushels, which comes down to USDA's tendency to underestimate demand, so we anticipate that those numbers are going to come closer together as well. Now, right hand, excuse me, left hand column, once again, I used our survey based yield, the 175.6, which is above USDA's 174.4. Based on our demand estimates, that would put ending stocks at about 2.7 billion bushels with a marketing year average cash price of $3.10 per bushel. Looking at a bearish scenario, and again, what I anticipate is most likely to happen is on the left, and then I kind of put some parameters on it on what is the more likely worst case scenario and best case scenario. So we start here by looking at the worst case scenario would be if the yield does get bigger again, which as I look back at history, has happened and can happen, and we get a yield of 178. Again, I don't expect this to happen, but I'm saying a what if. From a producer standpoint, you should focus on what's the worst case ever, since, uh, what's the worst case scenario. It's a sensitivity analysis. See if you can handle the risk of that happening. A 178 yield produce ending stocks of almost 3.2 billion bushels. Marketing year average cash price at $2.95 a bushel. On the other hand, if in fact this crop didn't finish as well, the combines show up what USDA couldn't find, and we end up dropping the final yield down to 168, well, that drops ending stocks all the way down to 1.752 billion. That's still larger than 2015 16 ending stocks by about 50 million bushels. Marketing year average cash price in that case scenario. At 435, do I expect this to happen? No. Uh, could it happen? It certainly could. I do not expect it to happen. 
I, what I expect to happen is in the left-hand column. As we look at the soybean balance sheet, here again, I'm using our yield, our survey-based yield of 50.1 bushels, marketing year average cash price, oh, excuse me, ending stocks at 340 million, marketing year average cash price at 915. If in fact this crop proves to be a 52 bushel yield, that pushes ending stocks at 600 and 619 million bushels, marketing year average cash price of 890. If the yield falls to 47 bushels, and here again, these last two scenarios are not expected, but still are possible, that would pull ending stocks down to 127, and that with some rationing of demand by higher prices, a marketing year average cash price of 1220 per bushel, and probably future significantly above that. Here again, that's not the anticipated, but that is still possible. Now, as we look at the weather overall, temperatures on the left, precipitation on the right. We see the one to five day at the top, the six to 10 day forecast in the middle, 11 to 15 day on the bottom. Overall, we're on the mild to cool side this week, but as we get into the weekend, next weekend, we warm up and we hold that through the remainder of the 15 day outlook. We're wet this week, particularly in central and western parts of the Midwest, but then that part of the Midwest dries out for the 6 to 10 day, with some rains returning to central areas in the 11 to 15 day. But harvest delays, not to be a, too big of a concern as we look at the 16 to 30 day outlook. The Midwest really does tend to dry out normal temperatures, so we should be able to get a good dry down in the field and a quick harvest. In fact, the month of October looks very favorable, both temperature-wise and rainfall-wise, for getting this crop in, uh, in the bin. We better get in the bin because November looks wetter and colder, so we need to try to get that crop in the bin before that pattern changes for the worse. This graphic, once again, shows uh, U.S. Uh, shows our condition index scores for corn on the top, soybeans on the bottom. Later today, we'll get the numbers for this this week. So this is last week's data. And you can see the green bar on the right is this week's condition score relative to other years at the same time of the week, early September. <clears throat> and you can see that the corn crop rating is in the top 20% of the last 30 years for this time of year. Soybeans, second only to 2014, and only by a point at that. The blue line there is the final yield for each of those years. So <clears throat> what are the take-home points? First of all, this report had nothing new for wheat. Nothing new of note. We'll have to watch for the September 30th report for ad additional data there. And that's also the day that we get uh, quarterly stocks numbers as well, reports that are known for their surprises. The trade assumes that the most bearish corn yield number is now in place and behind us. So the focus for corn will switch to storage issues and monitoring demand. The trade fears how big the October soybean yield might actually be, but it could also be smaller as well. Robust global soybean demand should help it weather the storm better than what corn or wheat would have at this point. South America must produce a big crop, and we probably need to add three to four million acres in the United States this next year as well. Watch the money flow. The Fed meets again next Wednesday to release their new monetary policy, and if they would happen to raise rates, the market's not expecting that. And that could have a big impact overall on money flow either in or out of the commodity markets. An increase in the rates would be expected to support a stronger dollar, a decrease, well, not expecting a decrease, but flat rates could lead to additional weakness. Long term, I'm expecting problems fundamentally with the euro and the yen to support a stronger dollar. That's more of a longer term outlook. So with that, we wrap up my presentation and we'll open it up for questions. So you can go ahead and, and start putting your questions in there and enter them on the screen in front of you and uh, I'll do my best to go through. <clears throat> we see a question from John. When does the level of ethanol production for 2017 on the RFS get set or determined? Could a large production uh, motive, could large production motive a larger target from EPA? 
Uh, excellent question. We're anticipating that number to come out from the EPA soon, but you know, I've learned not to hold my breath in the EPA. Uh, they've come out with numbers long after legally required to come out. The word was they were trying to get it out early this year, um, but so far just haven't heard it, uh, haven't heard it at all. But I do have a higher estimate for corn usage for ethanol. We're seeing good export demand, and we're seeing another state or two start to move toward increasing their statewide uh, recommended level to 15%. And so I think the combination of that and exports pushes us maybe 50 million above where USDA is at on ethanol usage, but that's not really going to save the day in the end. We just need to maintain it. Francisco, I heard that Chinese grain auctions are not attracting a lot of demand. Does it mean that the Chinese inventories are not good quality? If so, should I consider <coughs> excuse me, should I consider global inventories? A lot of it in China, yeah, better than 50% of it in China, <clears throat> in order to have a downside bias. Uh, at this point, uh, as I look at statistically, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I think the markets are already assuming that China's corn is basically off the market. As I look at price behavior over the last 10 years, taking China out versus China in doesn't make a great deal of difference. And uh, so I think the market is largely assuming that those Chinese stocks are off market. Susan, I missed your comments before you said that the funds need to be nervous being short. Um, they need to be nervous being short soybeans, very nervous being short soybeans right now because of the strength of the demand necessitates that we have a good solid crop, trend yield are higher in South America, and that we increase yields, excuse me, acreage by three to four million in the United States and U.S. Midwest next year. And that's assuming normal weather, any type of a hiccup in the weather would suggest that uh, we could have price rationing on soybeans and maybe significant price rationing. Um, but this is a market that I don't think the funds want to be short. I mean, they don't normally like to be short soybeans anyway, but certainly not this year. Any more questions? That's uh, the extent of what's been submitted to this point. I know last week we had a similar scenario and then all of a sudden it got hit with a whole bunch of questions. But I do want to provide enough time uh, to go through all the questions overall. I know many places are, and many of our viewers are starting to uh, focus on uh, on some of the early corn coming in, early harvest. A uh, question from Wes. Uh, once again, do you anticipate any increases in KC wheat terminal storage rates, thus encouraging potential movement of wheat out of those terminals and creating some space in the face of such a large storage issue this fall? Um, I, I don't at this point. It's very possible it could happen, but at this point, I have not heard anything along that line. Certainly, we're seeing the increase for soft red winter wheat, not hearing it for hard red winter wheat. Gary, what do you see the corn spreads doing? Well, Dodd-Frank doesn't allow me to specifically comment on prices or what I expect them to do or the spreads. Um, but I would certainly anticipate that the spreads would reflect what you would normally expect to see happen uh, when supplies are large and storage is tight. The question is how hot, fast will the store uh, will the market uh, will the harvest be? If we have a drawn out harvest, then we're able to use some of the corn in demand and have more space and not have the storage crunch or the pressure on the spreads. Um, but if we have a, a very short and abrupt harvest because a good dry down in the field, um, then we could see more pressure on those spreads uh, spreading out. Any more questions going forward before we close it out today? Here again, I wish I had a camera to uh, going reverse and looking the other way at you and interacting with you in these markets. Uh, here we got a question uh, from Paul. Do you see any of the over-counter products worthwhile in this market a year? Absolutely, I do. I think there's good opportunity in the over-counter markets uh, to, for producers to lock in floors while leaving the upside open. And I think there's tremendous opportunities at this point um, for those over-the-counter products, allowing the farmer to be able to sleep better at night 
and not just have to sell at a loss and walk away but keep the door open. Question from Peter. Can you talk through what you expect in the October report when FSA acreage is taken into account? Well, I have to see today's numbers from FSA. I would say the August numbers would suggest that USDA may be under-reporting acreage at this point, but I don't want to go too much detail on that because the August numbers are not real reliable. It's really what the September numbers do. And I think the concern of the market is we could have an increase in acreage uh, based on some of what we saw in August. That could have simply been because of farmer certifying earlier. So I'm looking to see if the August numbers uh, validate that or go to more normal levels going forward. And uh, we'll be putting something out later today or later this afternoon based on those numbers as they come in. Daniel, what are your general thoughts about strategies farmers should take from harvest forward? Watch your basis. Um, that's my big concern right now is will we have a home for all the crop? What might happen to basis in trying to find a home? And we could see some offers really plummet trying to discourage delivery. And I know we already have some places, particularly in the plains, who, who have said they may not take grain sorghum at harvest. And so because of the storage situation. And so that has to create some panic among farmers and certainly is a basis opportunity for an end user who does have space for it. Uh, and so if it's a spread out harvest, then we're able to move through it and find a home a little bit easier. So that's my big concern. Watch, watch overall your basis risk, depending on where you're located. That's gonna be bigger in the Western Midwest and the Plains than it is in the East, where we're more at a production deficit. Uh, and then watch the dollar, watch the Fed, because that's going to have a big impact, I think, on whether we have, in fact, put the bottoms in the futures market or whether they can make new bottoms here later this fall. Tanner asks, do you anticipate any problems with convergence in cash and futures for corn and wheat? We've seen problems. We've certainly seen problems in the past with our delivery system causing some convergent is convergence issues. I don't see anything that's going to change that or improve that anytime soon. Paul asks again, what are the odds of seeing 450 December corn in 2017? Well, I don't know if Dodd-Frank will allow me to answer that question. I do think that it's certainly possible, but we're going to have to have a significant change. And right now, the Black Sea crop looks to be big. I expect to see them be aggressive exporters of corn. Uh, we saw USDA raise their Brazilian production estimate uh, by a couple million metric tons this morning. I think that's appropriate. I think it could go up a little bit more yet. Uh, we see Argentina expanding their corn acreage by about 25%. So a rally to 450, I think, needs to see something change dynamically uh, with these fundamentals. Michael. With such a large corn carryout, what are the implications for the feeder cattle in as much as this market has been beat up the last several years? Well, large corn crop, and I think we saw it play out some today in the cattle market uh, expectations, is a large corn crop does suggest higher odds of lower prices rather than higher prices. And so it certainly should encourage feeding of, uh, of corn um, by the cattle feeder. Um, will it? Will we see that happen playing out? Well, that depends on whether wheat stays competitive, and that's the problem. Wheat and corn are now fighting for the same market space right now because wheat's having so much trouble on the export market. So overall, it looks like we finished our questions to date. I'll give it just uh, to, to this time. I'll give it a few more seconds here to um, move forward. Otherwise, let's call it a wrap and uh, look forward to seeing you again at, uh, I wish I could see you, having you with us again next week. And we have a lot of people who follow us, so if you ever can't uh, watch us because things get busy there at the office, uh, be sure to look us up and, and follow us afterwards. We post these on our website that you can follow them and, and view them after the fact. Susan, let's get one last, oh, say thanks. So I appreciate that, Susan. Thank you a lot. And uh, overall, uh, I'll say thank you, and we'll see you next next month, I guess. No, we'll see you on September 30th after the quarterly stocks and small grain summer report, a uh, report known for its surprises with big market implications. 
take care out there. Be careful with this harvest season. It's a big one and, and uh, be careful. Thank you.